Welcome, everyone. We have a special guest today. We have Casey Sheehan from Georgetown University School of Medicine going to talk to you a little bit about Georgetown and all the great things about their med school and what they're looking for in uh, applicants. So I'll let Casey take it away. Awesome. Um, nice to meet you all. Thanks so much for having me. Um, like Megan said, my name is Casey and I have been at Georgetown University School of Medicine for six years now. Um, so I started off in the Office of Student Affairs, so I really got to know the curriculum and working with students, and then I switched to the Office of Admissions about four years ago now and have been there ever since. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, share my screen. I have some slides. They should take about 25, 30 minutes to walk through, and then as soon as I'm done, I will answer it up, um, open it up to question and answer. So if you have any questions, even during the presentation, if you have questions that come up, feel free to just drop them in the chat. And as soon as I am done presenting, I will get to those and try to get through all of your questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so starting off, I always kind of like to set the scene by talking about Georgetown's philosophy of education, which is Cura Personalis. So Cura Personalis stands for care of the whole person, and it's actually the school motto for all of Georgetown, um, but it works very well for the School of Medicine as well. And we kind of take it into being in two different ways. So we use it to think about how we want to train our students um, to be educated and what type of physician we kind of want them to be. And then we also think about it when we're thinking about our students and how they need to take care of themselves in medical school as well. So starting off with the first one, Cura Personalis is really in every decision that we make having to do with the curriculum and um, all of the doctors that we work with and attendings and residents, we try to have them emulate this so that our students are learning it through them and that this is kind of creating the type of physician that they want to be in their career. Um, so what it means is it's the approach to medicine that you understand that medicine is rooted in science, but at its core, medicine is a human to human interaction. So it's one human being meeting this person, understanding that they're coming to them in a really vulnerable, scary point in their life. Usually um, they're seeking care. And as a physician, understanding that this is a person who has fears, has a life outside of the hospital, has family members, has a career. Oftentimes what you're doing might impact that. Um, and while you're making decisions, making sure that you have that top of mind and you make sure that they feel heard, they feel listened to, and that you understand that they are another human. Um, instead of sometimes getting lost and treating them kind of just as their diagnosis or thinking of them in that way, I'm sure some of you um, might have interacted sometimes with a doctor or a hospital system where you kind of just felt like a number and you just felt like you were kind of pushed through the system. Cure personalis is kind of the exact opposite. So really having like an individualized approach to medicine. Um, and then I also mentioned that we think about it in taking care of yourself. Medical school is a very difficult time. No one is going to tell you otherwise. But if you aren't taking care of yourself, um, you aren't going to be able to help others. So you need to be thinking about making sure you're getting enough sleep, exercise, time to pursue your hobbies and interests outside of medicine so that when you do come to take care of your patients, you're giving them your whole self and you're in a place where you can really take care of them. Um, another way to think about Cura Personalis is to think that every medical school you go to is going to turn you into a great okay, physician so scientist. You're going to know your basic science. Have, so you're going to know your so. clinical skills. Um, but what sets Georgetown apart is you're also going to become a physician healer and a physician advocate. So the physician healer is what I was talking about on the la last slide, but really thinking about how at its core, it's a human interaction. Um, and the advocacy side is just as important to us. So we're really lucky that in DC, we have so much we can take advantage of. Um, and we have different ways that our students can take advantage of this, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But just realizing that as a medical student, you already have a really powerful voice. You already have a really large platform. And using that platform and voice to help underserved populations, homeless populations, to make sure that you are helping everyone have access to health care. So if thinking about the healing side and advocacy side are really important to you, Georgetown could be a great fit for you. So I'm going to run through the curriculum now. We could talk 
for 10 hours about the curriculum, but I'm just going to give kind of a high level overview of how it's set up and what your four years would look like. Um, so about five years ago now, we changed our curriculum from what the original kind of idea of medical school curriculum is, which used to be two years preclinical, two years clinical, to this new idea, which is a year and a half preclinical, two and a half years clinical. I will run through as I'm kind of explaining the reasons why this is really beneficial for students. Um, but you start out with your foundational phase. So your first phase of the found of the curriculum is going to be your year and a half of preclinical curriculum. And how this year and a half is set up is you are going to run through six modules. So they are all on this graph in front of you in the top row. So the modules are set up. You'll have six weeks of content, a week to study, and then two weeks of exams. And then you'll move into the next module. Um, they start out with scientific foundations, which are just kind of deep dives into a lot of your basic science, biochemistry. And then once you have that foundation, you move into your human systems blocks. So how these modules work, your cardiovascular block, for example, you will learn everything to do with the human body with that system at once. So you're gonna learn your pharmacology, you're gonna learn your pathology, you're gonna actually be in gross anatomy, dissecting that part of the human body. You're gonna learn about all of the diseases, how to treat all of the diseases, everything that could potentially go wrong with that system, how it would affect other systems. So when you're thinking about it in this big picture kind of way, um, it's training you actually for your NBME step exams, because that's how all of those questions are set up. Um, but also it's just helping you in a way that's super helpful to think kind of big picture instead of learning the material more piecemeal, where you learn all of pathology, then all of pharmacology, then gross anatomy. This way, when you're thinking about it at once, it's actually really helpful for student retention. Um, and so it's just a great way to think about material and to move through it. Couple things to note about the foundational phase. It is completely pass fail. That was one of the big pushes that our students had when we were redesigning the curriculum. They really wanted the new curriculum to be um, less competitive, that they didn't feel like they ever had to compete against their classmates. And they wanted to be able to help each other and feel like that wasn't gonna negatively impact them. So we got rid of all of grading for the foundational phase. Um, another thing to note, we don't ever internally rank students. We don't have lists that we send to residency programs. We don't have rank lists or anything like that. So that's also really helpful because students just point blank are never competing against each other at any point in the curriculum. They never have to feel like they aren't because they aren't. Um, so that's just super helpful for mental health and overall feelings in the class as well. Um, another thing to note for the foundational phase, even though in this phase, you're going to have a lot of lecture classes, you're also going to have small groups. You're going to have one-on-one -on -one experiences you're gonna also have a lot of clinical experiences. So we think it's super important starting week one of your classes to start building in clinical experiences into the foundational phase. Um, we know that those are often what kind of push our students to keep moving through the like difficult weeks and exam weeks. Um, but we also think it's super important to start building those clinical skills really early on. So to learn how to take patient histories, how to diagnose patients, how to interact with interns, residents, attendings, and kind of learning all of that about a hospital really early on as well. Um, so this is kind of how the foundational phase is set up. After you take step one at the end of this, you are going to move into the core clinical phase of the curriculum. The core clinical phase is a really fun year. It's kind of when you get to sample all of the different specialties and really figure out what you want to go into for residency. Um, every student will go through these top clerkships. And then you will also have the chance to do three different selective rotations and then three different surgical subspecialties. Um, this is the area where having a year and a half preclinical, two and a half years clinical really starts to come in and be really beneficial because we were able to elongate the core clinical um, phase by about two months. So by doing this, we could actually add on extra selective students used to only have the chance to do one. Now they have the chance to do three. We stretch a couple of the clerkships a little bit longer. So you have more time in those and you can really figure out what you're interested in. Something to think about. I know this seems very far off to you all now because you're just trying to get into medical schools right now, 
but thinking about the residency application process will come up quickly. And when you're in that process, the most important thing to think about is what specialty you want to go into. But the second most important thing to think about is what type of hospital system you want to be in for residency. Do you want to be at a massive community hospital? Do you want to be in a smaller hospital in a rural area? Do you want to be in an academic teaching hospital, a military, military hospital? And so luckily, DC, having so many different hospital systems, um, and we actually have a couple affiliations in Baltimore as well, we have give our students the chance to rotate through all different types of hospitals. So you get to really experience all the different types of healthcare systems. You also get to see what it's like to serve many different types of patient populations. So you can really find out, for example, if you're really driven to serve underserved populations. Um, when you're applying to residency, you can pick programs that are in areas that those are the patient populations they serve. So it's just a really um, helpful thing to note as well. Take a list, look at the list of affiliations that the medical schools you're applying to have, because it's a really important thing to think about, even though that seems very far off. Um, a really cool opportunity that we have at Georgetown is our Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship. So this is available to about 40 of our students. Our class size is 200. So not everyone will have the chance to do this, um, but the majority of students that are interested do get the chance to do it. So what the LIC is, the normal st student running through the normal curriculum will, for example, do four weeks for family medicine. During those four weeks, two weeks will be in an in-service, two weeks will be, or two weeks will be inpatient, two weeks will be outpatient. How the LIC works is it looks a little different where it's gonna combine your family medicine, internal medicine, OBGYN, and pediatric rotations into one clump. So instead of rotating through different services and kind of working with different attendings every day, having different patient lists every day, the LIC tries to emulate what your life would be like post-residency if you went into one of these specialties. So when you arrive at the MedStar Franklin Square campus, you are given a list of about 20 to 30 patients. And for the 24 weeks you're there, those are your patients for the entire time you're there. So you will have at least one usually a couple patients that are pregnant. You will be at all of their check-in appointments leading up to birth. You might even be there when they give birth and then you will follow them and the baby at the appointments after birth as well. So it just kind of shows you what these specialties where you have like elongated points of care where you're taking care of patients for years instead of in something like surgery where your patient lists are changing kind of daily. Um, it shows you what that would be like. So we have a lot of students that do it absolutely love it and decide they definitely want to go into one of these specialties. And then we have some students that come out and just decide that they want to take another, um, go into another area. So it's just an awesome opportunity to explore that and get a chance to really figure it out early on. Okay. After your core clinical phase, you are going to move into your advanced clinical phase. The main point of the advanced clinical phase is to match you into the best program, best place for you. So really the entire year is kind of uniquely designed for each student. No student has an identical schedule for fourth year. Um, so the only requirements for fourth year is all students will do two acting internships. So in an acting internship, you're treated as you would be in your intern year of residency, where you're given patients, where they are your patients that you're taking care of. You have medical students that you're in charge of teaching. Um, and you're the main point of care for a lot of those patients. So everyone does one in medicine and one in the specialty that they're going into. And then on top of those two acting internships, everyone will do one four week emergency medicine rotation. Other than that, the entire year is just filled of electives and is really just however the student wants to design the year. So we have like over 120 different elective courses. So you could do any like niche specialty that you could have, like pediatric interventional radiology could be one. And you could do an elective in that niche area. You could do a research elective month. You could do a medical Spanish course. You could do an international rotation where you actually travel abroad and go somewhere else. Um, you can also do away rotations. So the advanced clinical phase, this is the main area we're switching to a year and a half, two and a half year curriculum really, really helps because you're actually going to begin your advanced clinical phase technically in April of your third year. 
So what this does is it gives you the beginning of April through the beginning of September when your residency application process begins to really figure out what specialty you're going into to definitely decide on it, put together your rank lists, figure out your letters of recommendation, write your essays, um, get kind of all of your ducks in a row. You just have so much more time. You have vacation time built in. It just becomes like a much easier, less stressful process as opposed to in the old curriculum, for example, you began your advanced clinical phase beginning of August. So you had one month to get everything ready for your residency application. And it was honestly chaotic. Students were always so stressed. Oftentimes we had students who still didn't know what specialty they wanted to go into, like come July, and they just kind of had to pick and go with one. Um, it just used to be very chaotic and it is now very relaxed. Everyone has time to think. It's just a much more stress-free process. The other thing that this allowed us to do is students have the chance to do many more away rotations. So what away rotations are? For some specialties, and also if you're applying to like really competitive programs in the specialty you're going into, students will often do an away rotation where they go and do a four-week rotation at the hospital that usually they're applying to for residency. So students used to only have the chance to do one or two of these since we started in August. They now have the chance to do like four or five of these. So you have so much more time. Um, away rotations also seem to be getting more popular. But you basically go to a hospital you're applying to. It's like a four week long interview. You get to know the interns, the residents, the attendings, they get to know you. So when you do apply, they're kind of watching for your application. They know if you're um, gonna, if it's gonna work out well and it gives you a leg up a little bit in the application process. So that's kind of a high level overview of what the curriculum looks like. If you have specific questions, happy to answer them. Um, but now I'm going to talk about a couple opportunities that we have at Georgetown that are kind of unique to us. Um, and then I will roll into the application process. But I briefly mentioned these, but a really cool opportunity that we have are our international programs. So Georgetown is really dedicated to the service of others. And we most of the time are thinking about it as it relates to DC. Um, but we do like our students to think about how it um, has to deal thinking about service on a global um, level as well and how they can give back to communities outside of their own. So the best way that we could do this is through international programs. So students have a couple different opportunities in the curriculum, a couple different times to actually go abroad and complete these programs. The first is spring break, um, your first year. There's a couple different international programs that students can do for that week. In between your first and second year, you have about a two month summer break. Students can complete service during that, um, international rotations. And then also in your fourth year, usually in January or February, so students have completed their residency application interviews and they are just waiting to hear back from match. About 30% of our fourth year students will do an international program then. Um, these are some of the areas that our students have gone before. It's just an awesome opportunity to get to travel, get to see other parts of the world, um, but also give back to these super impoverished communities that oftentimes wouldn't have access if it, access to healthcare if it weren't for some of these programs. So really cool opportunity for students. Um, we also have our longitudinal academic tracks. So the easiest way to think about these tracks, they're kind of like what a minor would be in undergrad where they are deep dives into really like niche areas of medicine and you work on them over your four years of um, your medical school. So they run kind of longitudinally throughout your curriculum and they are deep dives outside of the regular curriculum. Um, so I'm just gonna run through two. If you have questions about them, please feel free to ask after. And then we also are adding in two in January. So I can tell you the names of those. So we are adding in a spirituality and medicine track and an AI in medicine track. So those will be awesome as well. And those are going to be available for our current M1 students to apply for because you apply for these tracks in January of your first year. Um, but to jump into two of them, our health justice scholars track is our most popular track. We have students that come to Georgetown specifically for this track and how it works is Georgetown students are paired with Georgetown law students and Georgetown nursing students. Um, and they come together kind of in cohorts based on 
areas that they're really interested in, for example, like the price of pharmaceutical drugs, um, healthcare rights for incarcerated people, um, nutrition courses for underserved elementary schools, topics like that. And they actually look at the law that's in place right now, and then we'll go downtown and lobby for different bills to get passed, to talk to different senators and congressmen to make changes to law. Um, so it's really pretty awesome. It's something that students get are really dedicated to. I would say about 25% of each class will participate in the Health Justice Scholars track. So it's definitely our most popular track. Um, one more to highlight, our Medical Education Research Scholars track is really cool as well. Um, this is for students that are eventually interested in maybe teaching academic medicine, being a dean at a school one day, um, but they come up with a project. This track is grant funded, so this is the only track that has a limit to how many students can apply for it um, or who are accepted from applying and they'll come up with a topic in academic medicine that they're interested in. For example, a student that graduated in May did her project on how COVID-19 affected medical education and the students that were in medical school at the time, especially um, ones that like got pulled out of clinical rotations for a couple months. And so she did her whole project on that. Um, but it's just a really cool opportunity. You work with um, attendings and deans at the school and it's an awesome opportunity to learn more about academic medicine if that's something you're really passionate about. Um, so happy to talk about any of these individually if someone's interested in one of them, but that is kind of a high level overview of the tracks. Okay, so now jumping into what we look for in applicants. So in spirit of hero personalis in trying to understand the whole person, we holistically review applications. So what this means, we don't have cutoff scores. Every single person that requests secondary is set one. Um, we will look at the entire application at all seven areas um, that are in front of you right now before we make a decision. And we really try to get a feel for who this applicant is, what they would bring to the class, where they've been, and kind of get a feel for who they are as a person um, before making a decision. So that being said, applicants are much, much more than just their science GPA and their MCAT score. There are many other areas of the application that are just as important. So please don't get bogged down in thinking about that. I know it's hard to do, but we really do value experiences, essays, letters of recommendation just as much as science GPAs and MCAT scores. Okay, so to run through them all quickly now, um, starting out with your essays. So you are responsible for writing two essays for us. First, your AMCAS essay. Second, your Georgetown secondary essay, which just asks the question, why Georgetown? Um, so these essays, I know you all will write so many essays and be so sick of writing essays at the end of this, but they are a really important part of the application. This is the only area pre-interview that we can hear your voice and that we really get a feel for who you are, where you've come from, where you want to be. Um, so definitely spend some time coming to something like this. You are already so far above, so ahead of so many different applicants, just really trying to understand what Georgetown's about. Um, but they are really important. So spend some time on the essays. Next, your letters of recommendation. So we require minimum of two, maximum of five letters of recommendation. Um, if you have a committee packet, we prefer it, but it's not required. If you submit a committee packet, it fulfills the requirement. You don't need to submit any other letters, but you can submit an additional four on top of it if you want to. Um, we ask that at least one letter be from a science professor. But other than that, really find letter writers who can, sorry, um, that can speak to you as a person, can speak to your character, can speak to who you are. Those are the letters that are most helpful for us. Um, that in the essays, these are the really two areas pre-interview that we can really get a feel for who you are. Um, so they are really important parts of the application. Okay, next, your science GPA and MCAT score. So we are really going to only look at your science GPA. We will look at the rest of your transcript to make sure that there aren't any massive red flags but your BCPM or your biology, chemistry, physics, and math courses are the main courses that we're going to put most of our weight to. Um, so we say that a highly competitive applicant will have a 3.6 or higher. We consider a 3.0 or lower to be non-competitive. That being said, we do not have cutoff scores. We will not automatically reject applicants. We also really look for upward trends in applications. So if you had like a struggled in undergrad, 
or had a really rough freshman or sophomore year and really made a huge turnaround, that holds a lot of weight to us as well. Um, so just think about that. For our science prerequisites, pretty normal. The only one thing that's a little different is you're not required to take organic chemistry too. If you have biochemistry, you don't need orgo too. Um, you can have both. It's if, fine if you do, but you just need one or the other. And for math courses, statistics um, also count. So you can statistic count. Class will fulfill that requirement. For your MCAT score, we are going to most heavily consider your most recent MCAT score that you took. We're going to look at all of them, but most weight will be given to your most recent MCAT score. Um, our average is usually around a 511, 512. Our range is much wider than that. So please don't feel like you have to have a 511, 512 to be accepted. Um, but if you're like aiming to try to have a ballpark of where you should be, kind of round a 511 is where you want to be. Next, your experiences section. Um, so I think this is one of the most fun parts of the application. It really lets us know what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, what you've spent a lot of your time doing. Um, we are looking for like three main buckets of types of experiences. So those are academic research, service that underserved, and clinical experience. Um, for academic research, by no means do you have to have publications. You don't have to have worked for world-renowned PIs, nothing like that. We just like to see that you've had experience in it. Oftentimes also, like capstone projects can even be um, great research experience. It doesn't even necessarily have to be in science. By no means does it have to be like wet lab any like dry lab experiences are just as important to us. Um, we just like to see that students understand the research process and understand the importance in medicine. Um, next, service that underserved. So we think of this as directly in person serving someone who isn't from an underserved population. So that would be something like working in a soup kitchen, um, working at a free clinic, doing a medical mission trip or any type of mission trip, doesn't even have to be medical, um, volunteering with an organization like Special Olympics or Big Brother, Big Sisters, tutoring for underserved schools, anything like that. Also, we get this question a lot. It doesn't have to be volunteer experience. We know that there's some paid, paid experiences that are also where you're serving underserved communities. Oftentimes, even like EMTs will serve solely underserved communities. So that all counts to us when we're thinking about this. Next, clinical experience. So we think of clinical experience as being directly under the supervision of a physician or an interaction where you're getting to see the patient-physician interaction. Um, so something like scribing, shadowing, um, translating, working as an EMT, oftentimes clinical research positions, you get to see some of that, medical mission trips, anything where you're getting to see that patient-physician interaction. We just think it's really important that you have witnessed that um, in deciding like that you want to be a physician. And then also we just look for overall trends of community service and leadership as well. Okay, um, here are our social media channels if you want to check us out on there but I am going to stop sharing my screen, come back to you all and open it up to questions. So if you have questions, feel free to just drop them in the chat. Um, there are a bunch of us, so I think it's probably easier if everyone just drops the questions in the chat um, and I will get through as many as I can. First question I got, how are students selected for the LIC program? Um, so since we have 40 slots for them, most students that want to apply are accepted, but it is just an application process um, where you write an essay and talk about why you want to participate in the LIC, but the majority of students that apply for it are accepted for it. Um, does Georgetown have LGBTQ health as part of the curriculum? Yes, we do. Um, in our, we have our like um, sexual health section of it, and we have an entire section specifically for LGBTQ health. It is run by Dr. Singer, who has been at Georgetown for many years and is a huge advocate um, for the LGBTQ, LGBTQ community. Um, and it's super important to us and definitely a part of the curriculum. Um, for the course requirements, do they need to be completed before applying or before matriculating? Great question. So you can have two prerequisites. Um, that you haven't taken or that you will take pre-matriculation. So up to two can not be completed already, but you do have to complete them before you matriculate. 
Um, does Georgetown have an early acceptance program? We do not. We do everything rolling in admissions. Um, would, a count, would a class like genetics count for the biology requirement or do you need to take general biology? It's kind of done on a case by case basis. Um, if you like were tested out of general biology and genet in genetics is an upper level course that could count also if it has a lab um, or not having a lab is something we think is really important for the biology um, requirement. So you can always email us on those one-off um, requirements and me and Dr. Dugan, our Dean of Students, look at those. Um, what are some of the mental health resources available for students? Great question. So I would say probably about five years ago, we really started to put a lot of importance on mental health and realized how important it was in medicine and how high burnout was for medical students. Um, so there's a couple different ways. We have two deans at the medical school that are specifically there to think about wellness and to think about ways we can incorporate it. Um, one of the ways is through a course that we have called Mind Body Medicine. It is an optional course for students to take in their preclinical preclinical curriculum but usually I think it's like above 90% of students will elect to take it. And in this class, you're put into a cohort of about 10 other students in your class. And then it is taught by a faculty member um, that took the mind body medicine course and then was trained how to teach it or moderate it. Um, and it's just like a great small group that you're given to talk about stress, talk about wellness and medicine, talk about things you're struggling with. Um, we also teach like meditation, reflection, stress, rel stress relief techniques during mind-body medicine. Um, so it just gives our students two hours every other week to really spend that time focused on themselves, checking in with themselves and making sure they have time to think about their own mental health. Um, when we switch the curriculum, we also purposely built, built in a lot more breaks. So students have more vacations, they have more time off in between your foundational phase your core clinical and then your core clinical and your advanced clinical, you have two weeks off both times. So you have space to kind of um, relax, take time off, and then also switching pass fail for the preclinical curriculum was huge in helping mental health as well. Um, and then we also have a bunch of different student organizations that are like based on just like interest activities like biking, hiking, running clubs, yoga clubs. So we also have time for our students to participate in those as well. Um, let's see, a bunch of questions came in. Would something like hospice volunteering or volunteering at nursing homes count as clinical experience? So if there are physicians coming in that you're watching count, that would count as clinical experience. If it's mostly just interacting with nursing staff, it would be more community service. So still something great to have on an application. We would just like to see if you're not watching patient physician interactions in that role, that you have some other experience where you are getting to see that. Um, can AP credits count towards prerequisites? Yes, 100%. Um, as long as they're listed on your transcript, they count. Are there non-academic clubs at the medical school? Yes. So I just mentioned this briefly, but we have a ton of different non-academic clubs. We have like a social um, organization committee that all they do is plan social events for the medical students about every type of interest group for like I mentioned, um, like different exercise groups, different there's even a group that just goes and like checks out different art museums in DC often. So a bunch of different student clubs. We have, I think like 130 student clubs. So a bunch of different things. Um, do you value depth or breadth of experiences when considering an applicant? Great question. We kind of um, value depth a little bit more that you've like had a couple things that you really have shown passion in. That being said, oftentimes we have applicants who like in their undergrad really focused on um, just like their grades and getting through and then after really got like dedicated to certain organizations that's okay we have both both ways you don't have to have done something for like six years for us to like count it if you've really gotten into like some type of service organization post-college or in your like last years of college we will still value that so kind of both we are just like looking for like long-term trends of service experience. So that's something that we really are looking for kind of the depth of it. Um, do you accept, I answered this one, we do accept AP credits. Um, if you apply and get rejected, does that impact your chances if you apply again the following cycle? Great questions. No, it does not impact them at all. We have so many people that 
our reapplicants. Every year we have many students in our class that were reapplicants. By no means impacts you. A lot of people on our committee on admissions applied to medical school many times back in their day. We know that it is a rigorous process and students oftentimes apply many times. If you do reapply, the thing we're looking for is to see what you changed in your application between the last application and the new one. So what new experiences did you have? Did you really take like a hard look at your application and think, I could have more clinical experiences. That's what I really need to spend this next year working towards. Or I didn't do a great job of telling my story and really using the essays to tell where I've been and where I want to go. Did you change that? So that's what we're looking for in applicants if you've applied multiple cycles, but by no means hurts your chances. Um, what are the types of students Georgetown looks for in an applicant? What is the class culture like? So there used to be people used to talk about fit and that word should be thrown out. We by no means look for a certain type of student. We are actually looking for like really interesting, diverse people that have had awesome experiences and can bring really unique perspectives to the class. Um, but we look for this idea that everyone kind of has the same values and passions of like advocacy, service, giving back to underserved communities. So we kind of like, they'll call it like mission match, that that all is like tied together with our students and that that kind of bonds everyone together. Um, class culture, we have student panels once a month that you can join and ask the students themselves. But they always say the class culture is amazing at Georgetown. Um, we have 200 students, so we have really all different types of students that are interested in all different types of things. Um, but they are really good to each other since it's all pass fail. They really are there to help each other. They want everyone to succeed. It's a really tight knit group. Um, and everyone is really happy to be there. And since, I mean, if you pull together a group of students that are really passionate about kind of serving others and putting other people in front of themselves. You usually pull together a really cool group of people. Um, so definitely, if you want to know more about that, please join one of our panels. It's awesome to hear the student perspective as well, but class culture is really great. Um, does Georgetown value the humanities as well? How does Georgetown embed the humanities in medicine? 100% we do. We have a lot of students that um, were history, English majors, some people that were career changers and actually went into careers and came back and decided they wanted to be in medicine. So it's definitely something that we value. Um, a couple different ways we have actually, it's called a Georgetown Humanities. I forget the formal name for it, but it's basically a bunch of different programs at Georgetown are focused on how to bring humanities into their programs. Um, so we do it. We have actually a group that you can join if you're super interested in the humanities. You can talk with students from other different graduate pro programs as well. It builds this kind of huge cohort. Um, I think it's just called the Mel Medical Humanities Effort. Um, so we have that. We also have our one um, track. It's called Literature and Medicine Track. So that talks a lot about how humanities and kind of um, arts play into medicine. And then um, we also have a really robust arts and medicine student group that it goes outside of just like what you would think of traditional art. They talk about English, poetry, music, a whole bunch of different things um, for students that are really interested in that. And every year they put together this really um, awesome publication with all student work and thinking about how that plays into medicine as well. It's called Scope. I think it's online. Um, next question. Is the question for preclinical year exam six modules pulling from step one? And another way of saying, will students be prepared for step one during the preclinical year? Yeah, great question. So actually, a lot of our teachers at Georgetown are writers for step one exams. So all of our exams that we do are in line with how step one um, exams are written, which is in vignette style, where you have like a prompt telling you about a patient, about the whole situation, then you answer questions based off of that. And that's how all of our um, exams are set up. So we really try to prepare students as best as we can. Another thing, um, our step one study block is one of the largest around. Students have 12 weeks to study for step one, um, 10 weeks to study, which is a large amount of time. We have some students that will take it in five weeks and then they just get five weeks off after they have to take it. Some students wanna take the entire 10 weeks. Um, but during that also, we have like one-on-one -on -one help with our Office of Student Learning to create schedules for people that wanna study group study sessions for that. 
Um, so we try to do everything we can to make sure our students feel really wet, ready for step one. Um, if you have an experience that combines clinical and volunteering aspects, can we state that or does it only count as one? Definitely state that and it can count as two. You can have a lot of overlap. Oftentimes like clinical research positions are clinical and research. Medical mission trips are often service and clinical experiences. So they can definitely count in multiple buckets. Um, could you tell us how much of the current first year class came straight from college had gap years? Yes. So of our M1 class, 80% took a gap year, 20% came straight through. Um, so that does seem to be a shift. It seems to be a lot more people are taking gap years. Either way, it doesn't matter. We don't have a preference for one or the other. We're just seeing more students take gap years. Um, but if you are going through, you're not at a disadvantage because of it. It just seems to be the trend that a lot of our applicants now are taking at least one gap year. Do you accept transfers from other medical schools? Unfortunately, we do not. Um, would teaching middle schoolers for a literacy nonprofit count as helping underserved communities? Definitely. Um, does it require biology to be taken in a college setting? I'm not exactly sure you mean by that, but I think the answer to that is yes. It needs to be taken like on a college level. Um, it can be taken at a community college, though. We get that question a lot. Um, does GT also have engineering majors apply to medical schools? If so, are they looked down upon because they could have also gone into industry or the engineering field but decided to apply to medicine? I love this question because I went to Georgia Tech for my undergrad, so have been surrounded by engineers for a long time, and we do have a lot of engineers apply, and by no means are they looked down upon. Um, we often have a lot of biomedical engineers apply, and it's just kind of a really interesting perspective, but it can be in any field of uh, medicine, no matter what your major was, that doesn't really have an impact either way on your application. Um, how do you recommend applicants spend their gap year? So really, it's up to you to really kind of Spend time doing what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. Um, find activities that you feel like you can really talk about in your interviews and you can explain well why you're doing that. Um, but also, I always recommend like taking a hard look at your application, thinking about do you need more research experience? Do you need more clinical experience? Do you want to take up a job to save some money for medical school? Something like that. It's really up to you. There's no preference that we have for it. It's just kind of how you use that year. Um, to shape your application. Any other questions? I'm going to, if someone's typing, um, drop my email address in the chat. So if anyone has questions that come up after this, if you forgot to ask something, a couple months if you want to ask something, feel free to email me. Happy to respond to emails. But is there anything else I can help with while we are here? I think we're good. Oh, one more. Um, how do engineering majors highlight themselves? So just as any major would, it's part of your story. Um, so no matter what area you come from, just talk about how your major and how your courses and how where you've been helped turn you into medicine and um, bring you on that path and just using it as like a point to tell your story is what I would recommend for everyone. Um, are students at a disadvantage for applying later in the cycle? So we are rolling admissions. Um, so it is beneficial to apply in the beginning because we can't have interview slots fill up. That being said, if we are obsessed with an applicant, if we think that they would be an incredible addition to the Georgetown class and they apply late in the cycle, we'll find an interview spot for them. So it's beneficial, but if you're like an incredible applicant and we must have you, we'll find room for you. Anything else? I think we've wrapped up. Right. If we got quiet in the chat, then we will wrap it up. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much, Casey, for joining us. Um, it's great to hear about Georgetown. So have a good night, everyone. Uh, we will 
send out the recording later and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.